A few pages into her book, Becoming Grandma, The Joys and Science of the New Grandparenting, which I loved and read and I'm not even a grandparent, you quickly realize this story is truly a labor of love that's written and researched with a reporter's keen instinct to explain the pure and unexpected joy that she's experienced. And tonight we are honored and thrilled to have Leslie here to tell us more about her process and the story behind the story. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Leslie Stahl. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Laura Kovacs. It is my honor to talk to you tonight. Um, Jessica mentioned your towering career, but tonight we are gonna start with grandparenting. Yes. Um, <laughs> One of the most beautiful sections in the book, I think, is how you describe the first moment you held your oldest granddaughter, Jordan. Would you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. My first grandchild. You know, I, I'm sure, how many grandparents here? Oh, look, <laughs> all right. So you know, you know. Um, I had been told, as we all had been, that there is nothing better in life than having a grandchild. Then. It was my turn. I get there, the baby's born, I finally get my turn. And my daughter wouldn't give up her baby. Finally, it was my turn. And when I held her, I was hit with an astonishing, deep, never felt before euphoria that just took me, my whole body. And uh, every time I held her, it came back. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was wonderful, but I didn't know what it was. Um, so what somebody asked me to write the book, it wasn't really my idea. Um, I thought one of the things I would try and find out was one, does that happen to all grandmothers? And does it happen to grandfathers? And then what is it? Uh, so that was really the starting point of the book. What was I going to investigate? And the first investigation was the sort of biochemistry of being a grandparent. And it's a diff it was a different feeling than when you first held your daughter. Oh, totally different. Um, when, I, when we first hold our children, um, we love, it's an intense love, but we know from day one that we have the responsibility of uh, whipping them into shape, um, of protecting them so that our love is, it, it is not unfettered. It is kind of uh, complicated by these responsibilities. Grandparents don't have that. We love purely. We love 100%. Uh, and what I found out through the biochemistry angle was that like our, our children, like the mother of the baby, um, grandparents, our re brains are also rewired. Uh, we start secreting a hormone called oxytocin, which physically binds us to the baby. Um, we are transformed. It's not an accident, I don't think, that virtually every grandparent who may have been highly critical of their own child, may have been strict with their own child, turns into a total mush ball. I mean, that child is loved without, we can't criticize, you know, something just goes wrong in us, we can't do it. We don't see, we don't see any reason to criticize them. And we seem to have the word no completely disabled. <laughs> they want something, the word yes comes out, that's it. So why does it happen to all of us? It, it, it happens to all of us. So something very uh, universal and physical happens. And it's all nice for us. In <clears throat> fact, the subtitle of the book is The Joy and Science of the New Grandmothering. What was the most surprising scientific fact you uncovered? Well, the most surprising biochemical fact that I learned <clears throat> is that the pathway in us, the wiring, the, neuro, the neurons within us uh, for romantic love is exactly the same as for baby love. So when grandparents talk about, you know, falling madly in love, which we say about our grandchildren, 
We, I fell madly in love. I heard it over and over. I was head over heels over that baby. We use the language of romantic love because it's the same. And uh, the only difference is that with your grandchild, it doesn't fade. And it stays. <laughs> <laughs> and it stays up there. Uh, but it is the same pathway. I found that fascinating. Is there something unique about the grandparent-grandchild relationship, or is this a role that anyone can fill? I'm asking about surrogate grandparents and step-grandparents. Um, well, one of, so the, the first reason I, wanted to, I agreed to write the book and wanted to write the book was to find out the physicality of my emotions. The second reason was, and the reason I thought this could fill a whole book, as opposed to like a little essay, was uh, because I'm <clears throat> in a ladies' lunch group in New York. And there are six of us, and four are step-grandmothers. And my girlfriends had, had their grand, well, one of them had her step-granddaughter at virtually the same time I had my first grandchild. And we spoke about it in exactly the same language. She went through the same exact bonding, physical, deep loving bonding that I did. Exactly the same. Same language, we, we, we were on the same exact wavelength. So I wanted to write about step-grandparenting for that reason. I mean, it was in my head from the first time I sat down to write. Um, the other thing I found out that Surrogate grandparenting is as, well, what, let me take a step back. Grandparenting, taking care of your own grandchild, and the, there have been studies, it's been documented, make, makes you healthier, fends off dementia, if you can believe it, <laughs> lifts depression, and just generally makes us happy. Well, surrogate grandparenting does the same thing. Now, I'm not talking about the, the chemical b bonding, because usually when you surrogate grandparent, the children are older. Uh, but you can have that same sense of fresh new life, new purpose, um, and loving, deep, you know, unconditional loving. If you take care of uh, another kid who may not have a grandparent or whose grandparent lives far away. One of the most surprising things from my perspective in the book was this feeling you describe, and a lot of your friends and the people you talk to echo this feeling of being on eggshells oh. around your daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's surprising to me. My, I have a baby, and there's no one in the world I would trust more than my mom, right. or my mother-in-law, for that matter. Um, and yet it seems to be a universal feeling. Pretty universal, not 100%. But we baby boomer grandparents, we are being so careful. <laughs> we do not want them to be irritated by us. We do not want them saying, uh, stop telling me how to raise my own child. We don't want them saying, don't come next weekend. You know, so we are just watching it every minute of the day, biting our tongue, lest our own children, our own children say, you know, I just, you, you can't come next weekend, I can't stand it, or we've upset the granddaughter, the, the daughter-in-law. We've upset the daughter-in-law, that's the worst thing that can happen <laughs> to grandparents. So we know how careful we have to be. When that baby's born, we know, we know it, that the balance of power in the family has instantly shifted, and they now have the key to what we want more than anything on earth, <laughs> which is that those babies. We want those babies. And so, at least this is what I found in my interviewing. And um, I feel it myself. I know, I happen to have been there with my, my, my daughter and her children and her husband live in Los Angeles and I live in New York. But we happened to be there when they decided they were gonna sleep train. Now, I didn't do that with my child. That's another thing, you know. We didn't do that, and you turned out okay. <laughs> Never, doesn't cry. <laughs> so I'm there. This is, a, this is an amazing story. I'm there, and with sleep trainings, which means that you just let the kid cry. Oh my God, 
I thought someone was pouring acid up and down my arms. I couldn't stand it. And I just didn't say anything. And I know I was holding on to the side of the chair, but I didn't say anything. It was so good. And my husband and I were uh, staying at a hotel, so we left early. It, 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 we left early. And we get in the car, and my husband said, you know what they're saying right now? And I was like, well, he says, they're saying, thank God she left early. And I said, why? I didn't say a word. I was the sphinx. Not a word came out. And my husband said, are you kidding? You never shut up. I said, what? He said, you, you told them all through this whole thing. I can't stand it. You have to go. let me go in there. I said, I didn't say a word. He said, you said over. I didn't think I said anything. Now go explain it. I think that happens a lot. I think that we think we are sitting on it. And whether we actually say it or just grip the side of the chair or look funny, they know. <laughs> they, they know what's going on in our heads, <laughs> which is, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you giving them tofu? <laughs> uh, you describe a very sensitive and a very candid conversation with your daughter's mother-in-law, your granddaughter's other grandmother. Right. What was that like? Oh, my God. Well, even before I had that conversation, <clears throat> a, a friend of mine put together a grandmother roundtable uh, for me to talk about the relationship between grandmothers and daughters-in-law, so mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. <clears throat> and it turned out to be quite amusing, and I basically put the transcript in the book because it was funny, um, and not funny, you know. So. Uh, what I learned that afternoon was that between daughters-in-law and mothers-in-law, um, there can be a lot of tension, and it's kind of universal. I mean, in, Chi in India and in China, all the soap operas are about that. <laughs> so it goes way back, and I mean, you know, Juvenal in, in the ancient Greece, in ancient Greece wrote about that tension. So then one of the women brought up the tension between the two sets of grandparents and told me that there was a, an innate competition. And even if you don't want it to be true, you're, this is what she told me, you're always thinking, did, they, did the kids love them more? Did they spend more time with them? You know, that kind of thing. So my boss read, read my book before I actually published it, but when it was done, he's a brilliant, uh, editor, so I, th I knew I was going to get some serious criticism. And he calls me in, and he went through the whole book with me. And then at the end, he said, you know, you don't write about the other grandparents. And I said, yeah, well, I didn't know how to do it. So I just thought, well, no one's going to notice that I didn't write about it. <laughs> you cannot write a book and talk about your own family and not. I said, I, still, I don't know how to do it. I've tried. It's not as if I didn't try. He said, you know what, why don't you call her up and interview her? So I asked my son-in-law to call her <laughs> and ask her if she would give me an interview because I, I thought even just asking her would be difficult. And it's not as if we don't get along. We get along great. It's just that there was some kind of barrier between us. <clears throat> so he said she'd be happy to be interviewed. So I called her up and I interviewed her. I don't want to say everything because I want you to read the book. <laughs> but I asked her one, the first question I asked her was if she thought it was harder to be the paternal grandmother, if it was harder to, to be the mother of the father. And long pause, and she said, yes. And it went from there. <laughs> I mean, I, it is without question the most difficult interview I've ever done. And, you know, I know you watch 60 Minutes, so you know that this is saying a lot. It's really, really hard. But she was unbelievably honest with me. And, by the way, the air was completely cleared, and we are like that now. We just spent a couple of weeks, uh, days together. Um, so... <laughs> Boy. That old Freud, he just comes in there every now and then. 
but it did clear the air, and if you're having that tension, I recommend an interview. <laughs> you end this book with basically a call to arms um, to become more involved. Why is this such an important message? Um, <clears throat> Well, I met a woman who is the Dean of Public Health at Columbia University Medical School. And she spends her time thinking about what she calls the third 30th of our lives. So she said, the first 30 years, we educate ourselves. The middle 30 years, we uh, make money, we raise our children. And then there are these added 30 years that mankind didn't have before, because we're gonna live into our 90s and our 100s. So we retire 30 more years, then what? And society hasn't talked about that, hasn't planned for it. <clears throat> People aren't even maybe thinking about it very much. <clears throat> so I decided that in the call to arms that people should begin thinking about using those extra years um, to spend with your grandchildren. Um, there is actually this trend, and it's growing, and it is a trend, of grandparents, when they retire, picking up, selling the house they've lived in for 50 years, either throwing out a lot of junk or selling it or whatever, and moving to be with their grandchildren, to be in their lives, to watch them and grow up and be part of that. Um, <clears throat> and. It is, it is really good for the children. They need their grandparents. You know, society, humankind, society has always been built around the fact that grandparents live with the family. You go back to the cave, the caveman. The, both parents went out and hunted. The, the man and the woman hunted. And grandma stayed home to take care, to raise the kids, to take care of the kids. There's something, I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but there's something called the grandmother hypothesis. And this is some of the science I came upon in researching the book. You know, most other animals die when they can no longer reproduce. It's Darwinian. You know, they're just, if they can't reproduce, all they're doing is taking food from other people in the family. And go to almost any other animal except whales and elephants and us. We are the only creatures that have menopause and live beyond our reproductive years. Why? Well, apparently, according to the hypothesis, with humans anyway, <clears throat> grandma stayed home and took care of the babies. And when she did, the babies had a much higher uh, chance of surviving and a much higher chance of being healthy. Um, and the parents could go out and do what they had to do. And this was more or less the case, the way society was, was ordered until the Industrial Revolution. We all lived together, and grandma and grandpa helped raise the children until uh, urbanization came along and the family, the multi-generational family split up. So I think that as a human animal, we need to take care of those children. It's in our bones. They need us. We provide them with that unconditional, you know, worshipful loving that a person needs to know they're lovable. And, um, and uh, as I said, they make us healthy. And now today, with the economy the way it is, our kids need our help. Because uh, both of them are working, they're exhausted, they're strung out, um, and childcare is hideously expensive. And a working mother will trust, you said this, no one as much as they trust their own mother or mother-in-law to take care of their children. Plus, the other thing that I came upon, which I know will not surprise this audience one bit, is that we are spending more money on these children <laughs> than grandparents have ever spent, ever. Today, this is a statistic I discovered, unfortunately, after I published the book, but it's good. Grandparents today are spending seven times more on their grandchildren than grandparents did just 10 years ago. <laughs> You're laughing because you know. Um, we're, we're spending money um, on childcare. We're sending them to school. We're paying for the nanny or the childcare. 
and we're buying toys, okay, but we're also buying the crib, we're buying the car seat, and there's at least one grandmother I know, me, <laughs> who bought them a piano. <laughs> and I did that because my daughter wouldn't practice, and I am determined I'm going to get one <laughs> piano player out of this <laughs> life of mine. <laughs> so, and, but I think we are, in many ways, already deeply involved with these grandchildren. And my call to arms is you get more involved. That's my call to arms. Do you worry differently as a grandmother than you did as a mom? Oh, yes. I think we worry much differently. Um, I, and I do think it's partly this chemistry. Um, when a, when a, I learned this, too. When a mother gives birth, <coughs> uh, there are not just the oxytocin bonding chemicals that are set off, but there are all kinds of um, watchfulness hormones. I mean, we mothers and fathers too become lionesses, you know, and they're vigilant. There's a vigilant hormone that goes off. So this idea that you're always worried, always, really, until they go to college and sometimes after, you know, if they stay out late, you're worried. I, I was, a, I'm, I'm, I bet many of you in the working, here were working mothers, and you go to work and you're worried. Uh, have I forgotten something? Will she be picked up? Oh my God, did I miss a doctor's appointment? I mean, the, the worry is incessant. Grandparents don't have that at all. Um, now, if a child's sick, a grandparent does worry. Um, but we're not, we're, we're not suffused with those kinds of chemicals, I guess, if you want to say that. Uh, so I think we are left purely and simply to love them. Uh, that's our job, that's our role, and it's easy to fulfill, and it comes naturally, and so it's very different, very different. Uh, uh, do you agree? Yeah, okay, I want to make sure. How have your career demands changed as a grandmother? How what? How have your career demands? Oh, my career You're still demands. You're juggling a, a major career? Um, the major difference for me is that I'm doing more stories in California. <laughs> <laughs> it's a major difference. Um, I, at 60 Minutes, we're uh, clumped into teams. So each correspondent has a team of producers who are assigned to her or him. And uh, I told my producers five years ago, when my first grandchild, Jordan, was born, that um, I'll do any story they propose in California. <laughs> and the way it usually goes is that the producers pitch stories to the correspondents. At 60 Minutes, it's just, it's paradise for a journalist because um, we are responsible for finding our own stories. And that means that we're always committed to the story. We're, we're not complaining, oh my God, I have to do this because the boss wants me to do it. We find our own stories. <clears throat> um, so they pitch me. And sometimes I just don't like it, you know? I don't want to do it. Uh, I've told them if it's in California, I'll do it even if I don't want to do it. So <laughs> that's the big thing. That's the major thing. You go into some detail in the book about your relationship with your mom. Um, she was really passionate about your success professionally. Um, did her approach change as a grandmother? She, she was just like all of us. She was a mother who was on my case. I mean, it was endless. And the day she became a grandmother, she turned into a marshmallow. <laughs> Except she didn't lose that thing about criticizing me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that happens to all of us. I think we, be, we, we become so permissive and indulgent with the grandchild, but we still can you know, feel a little, we can feel that our kids aren't doing it the right way, even if we sit on it. But I wanted, I'll tell a story about my mother, okay? Um, I tell it a lot, so if you've ever heard me speak, you've heard me tell it, but it's pretty interesting. She, she always criticized me, always. I, I never did anything right. And um, she wanted my career for me. She, felt, she was one of those women who was really smart, uh, who was stuck in the suburbs, didn't work, 
and, and was not happy. And she didn't want that for her daughter. So she told me early on, um, you're gonna have a career. It's not gonna be a job. I don't care what it is, but it's gonna be a career. <clears throat> and she, you know, it was always, she said, what about architecture? What about medicine? But it was gonna be a career. So then it was gonna be journalism, not my choice. And she just was on me. Because uh, she, you know, go, can't you go to New York and get a better haircut? Because I was <laughs> reporting in Washington. Or let me buy your clothes. She bought my clothes till I was 35 years old. <laughs> so I arrived at CBS. They hired me the year that affirmative action went into force. And about two weeks after I arrived in Washington, there was this burglary at the Watergate complex. And nobody in Washington thought, or anywhere, thought it was any kind of deal at all. It was just a local B and E, and uh, but it was at the Democratic Party headquarters, so they felt they had to send someone over there. <clears throat> so they sent the new girl, and um, it was intriguing from the beginning to me, but to no one else. I don't want to say no one else, but there was one other person, which I'll tell you about. So I went over. The first thing I covered was the arraignment, which was the day after the burglars were caught. And I'm in a courtroom, and there's one other reporter in the courtroom, Bob Woodward. <laughs> yes. And over the years, because this story lingered and lingered, every time it died, because it would die, Woodward would say, don't let them take you off the story. You stick to that story, whatever. I said, but it's over. He said, no, it's not over. Stick with the story. So I stuck with the story. And of course, it became the biggest story in the world. And eventually, there were Senate hearings. And as you all remember, the networks, there were only three in those days, we all ran the, the hearings live. So it, you could stay home all day and watch them. <laughs> but if you didn't stay home, CBS did a special every night. And we took the highlights. And then we had a round table with the correspondents. And the men, it, there were always three of us, and the men would vary, White House, uh, congressional, judicial correspondent, but I was always there because CBS wanted to prove that they were an equal opportunity employer because <laughs> affirmative action was popular. So I'm there, and these are veterans, and I'm, I'm relatively, I'm a rookie, and, but I'm there, <clears throat> and they won't let me talk. <laughs> so whatever, we had a moderator, would ask a question, and they'd argue, they'd fight, they'd fight, and then the next question, they'd fight, and, I had this disembodied, but don't you think, well, I agree, I just, and they never let me say anything, till finally, I mean, maybe a full week later, the bosses call us in, and they say, you know, we're, get, we're flooded with phone calls and telegrams and letters, you know, free email, um, people thinking that you guys are being rude to Leslie because you won't let her talk. Now, these things are like, uh, you know, boxing matches. You gotta fight your way in, and the honest truth is I wasn't, seasoned enough to fight my way in, but the audience thought they were being rude. And the bosses said, look, if you don't let her talk tonight, we're not doing this anymore. And everybody loved doing it, so I knew I was gonna talk. And we get out on the set, and he's alive, and the, we had a moderator, and he said something along these lines. Well, folks, what's the gossip in Washington about John Ehrlichman? <laughs> right, and I hear the word gossip, and I say to myself, Look, this is, I am not going to gossip. Let the guys gossip, right? And I'll do the next question. So I sit there. But they know I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> so they sit there. And so there are now three people on television sitting there. No one says a word. I mean, endless. I, you know, who knows how long, but it felt endless. Finally, Daniel Shore. Remember Dan? Yeah. Huh. So he jumps in and says, something along the lines of, oh, you want gossip? Well, we have a woman here. <laughs> oh yeah, bad, really bad. <clears throat> I was really flustered, I was angry. I opened my mouth and total gibberish flowed. Nothing parsed, John Ehrlichman never came up. I've read the transcripts, it's humiliating. I stopped talking in the middle of a sentence because I, I just wound down, it was horrible. I ran upstairs and I called home and my father answered the phone. And I said, Dad, you have to help me write my letter of resignation. 
I'm going home, I'm gonna sit in the closet. I'm never gonna be seen again. This was so bad, I'm so, oh my God, I wanna die. My father said, being a father, oh, come on, you were great. You were terrific, you were so smart. I said, Dad, I was a disaster. And if you can't be honest with me, put mother on the phone. <laughs> And my father said, mother can't talk right now, she's too upset. <laughs> so that was my mother. And then my, my daughter was born, and I watched this transformation, and it was instant. It was unbelievable. She just, you know, there's a grandmother gaze. Grandfather, too, there's a grandparent gaze. And we just look at them, and we soften, and our eyes get all crinkly. And there's nothing else going on with a grandchild. When you're a parent, you know, there's so much else going on in your head. What, what thread am I dropping and so forth? You're a grandparent, there's only that right then and there, real time, total attention. My mother had it, yeah. I am about to throw this out to our audience, so I'm gonna ask you just one last question, which I like to ask all tough women that I come across. Is it a tough question? Nope. It is, uh, how do you approach frightening situations? How do you overcome fear? You have been in some dangerous situations and you never appear flustered at all. Well, you know something? I don't think I ever have been afraid. Um, I know I've been in some dangerous situations, <clears throat> but I've never felt fear. Part of it is that we travel with such a large group. Um, 60 Minutes still does our stories the same way we've always done them meaning that we go out with two camera people, a cam two cameramen, two sound men, and I always travel with producers, two producers. So we're always uh, two, four, six, you know, it's, it's a, an army. Um, so I, I have my, pr my little protection. If we're in danger, CBS hires bodyguards for us. Um, so um, I've never really felt afraid, and I think there is something about the eye of the hurricane. You're in there, and it just doesn't feel frightening. Um, so I can't answer your question. I think the, the scary thing for me, the frightening thing, is asking a parent who's lost a child, which we do a lot, about that child. Now that is really hard. Um, asking someone to talk about something that's painful personal, revealing, um, and the camera's rolling, and they're nervous, um, that is really hard for me. And interviewing my daughter's mother-in-law was really hard for me. <laughs> it's really hard. So those are the things, but I, I don't think I've ever really felt danger. Maybe I'm crazy, but. Maybe you're so tough you don't know you're in danger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And of course, no one thinks they're tough. No one thinks they're tough. I once, someone wrote that I was tough and I called my dad and I said, they're saying I'm tough. And he said to me, you're not tough. You know what's tough? I said, what? He said, firing someone, which I've never had to do, so. It's an honor to be able to share being a grandmother with you. Um, I just had my second and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the dynamics of a second or, and a third or a fourth grandchild and, and, and or <laughs> however many one ends up with, but just how, how is that different? How, do you, how did you handle that? Um, well, for me, it was exactly the same. I mean, I just did it all over again. But I have, um, I, I actually never interviewed a grandmother who's had eight or nine or 10 or whatever. Um, but I, I've been told um, that, you know, it get, as you go out with the numbers, it's, it, it kind of softens. Now I've been told that. But it didn't for me with two. Um, I thought it might. I was a little worried about it. But that same, I don't know, that same physical connection happened to me. I've, I've also spoken to grandmothers who have eight and say it it's sustains. So I've heard both. I don't know, is there anybody who has eight, 10? I've, I've been signing books. People say, I have 11, I have 16, I'm a great grandmother of four. I mean, it's amazing. And in the line, they tell me that everyone is, is a deep, deep love, so. 
I've heard both ways. Two brief questions. One is, uh, could you discuss the difference, if any, between grandfathers and grandmothers? And the second, maybe more interesting question is, when are you moving out to LA? <laughs> That's a good question. <clears throat> well, grandfathers are just as besotted as grandmothers, um, although the, the physical chemistry of it is, is different. Uh, they don't have necessarily that oxytocin, but they have that same thing that happens to them physiologically, where they go from maybe having been an incredibly strict father, um, a demanding father, kind of a policeman father, into being, you know, playmates. Uh, I, my husband and many other grandfathers uh, go to tea parties and play with dolls. And, um, and they, I've often been told, I, there's something in my book called Granny Nannies, and these are grandmothers and grandfathers who take care of the child Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Or I've had many say, well, I have Wednesday and Friday, and the other grandparents have Monday and Tuesday. Um, grandfathers are often, I'm told by the grandmothers, better nannies than the grandmother, and the grandmother says, he has more patience, he's more playful. Um, I've seen this time and again where you have uh, a couple where the husband is older, which is pretty common, and he retires before his wife does. And he becomes the, the, the grandparent who is spending every day picking the grandchild up at school, uh, taking him to sports or whatever, uh, and, and he is happy as a clam. This is what he wants to do. So I've inter I interviewed a lot of really what we would all think of as hardened men. I interviewed the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, <laughs> and he told me that when his first grandchild was born, his knees buckled, <laughs> and he had to hold on. My own husband said to me, I said, did you have that physical rush that I had? And he said, no. And most grandfathers told me no. I said, then what, what do you think this enormous love is? And he said to me, this was my husband, he said, I think it was watching my daughter mother. He said, I love my daughter so much, which is, that, that relationship is the relationship of all time. And he said, I just was overwhelmed, you know, seeing the, the maternalism come out of her. So, and I wondered if that was part of it too for, for me as well. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons that we love them the way we do. It's not just the physiology. Um, you know, a lot of men told me that in a way they think subliminally, they realize that their line is gonna go on, the bloodline's going on. And um, one of the grandfathers said, you get struck by how you are both mortal and immortal all at the same time. And a, a grandmother told me, gosh, this was incredible. A grandmother told me, because I kept asking, what do you think that emotion is? And they kept, I had all these different answers. She said, well, it struck me that the seed of my grandchild was in my daughter when she was in my womb. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing. Well, lucky for me, I'm still working because I like what I do still. I haven't gotten tired of it yet. And you wouldn't either if you worked at 60 Minutes because it's so terrific. Um, but I think that uh, when they give me the hook, um, that, that's definitely an option. I don't know that I'd give up my apartment in New York but I would spend an awful lot of time in Los Angeles. I, I want to know their story. And you know, I, I was old when I had my daughter, and she was a little older when she had her children. Um, and that's the sad thing about waiting, because you, you, begin, you begin to war get a little sad that you're not going to know the story. You know, are they going to have children? Are they going to get married and be happy? You don't, you're not going to know that. So. So I, I, the answer is I'd love to spend much more time in Los Angeles, but keep my apartment in New York. Any hints for long distance relationship 
building and keeping it going when you can't physically be there. All five of our grandchildren are not local. Let's hear it for FaceTime. <laughs> a grandparent's best friend and Skyping. Um, we do a lot of FaceTiming. And my daughter takes to <clears throat> putting the, her phone uh, and letting us just watch the kids run around. Uh, they talk to us now. They're old enough to, to talk back to us. But we just love to watch them. And uh, we do a lot, on, especially on weekends. Uh, but it's hard not to see them every day. And I believe that because of the history of mankind, um, we're meant to see them. And when we don't, we actually physically crave them. And when we say we miss them, we, we mean it. You know, it's, it's, it's a heartache not to see them every day. We should be, that's why the call to arms. You know, it, it's good for them, it's good for us. No, I don't want to be repetitive. What was it like to work with Andy Rooney? And was he lots of fun and we miss him so? <laughs> Andy Rooney was my friend, so you have to know that. We, we actually were social friends, we used to go to dinner. He lived, he lived near me in New York. He's a real curmudgeon. He really is a curmudgeon. Um, and he, he, he played on that. He'd walk, he, first of all, you should know that 60 Minutes is across the street from CBS News. We were in a separate building. We are in a kind of an insurance building, you know, that looks like an insurance company. Um, and the big CBS News building where the broadcasts come out of and so forth, and the newsrooms are across the street. And Don Hewitt, who created 60 Minutes, said, I don't want to be over there, the executives. We're going to be separate, and we're going to be an enclave. So we don't even work on the same side of the street. Well, Andy, kind of like Don Hewitt, separating himself from C CBS, said he didn't want to work with us in the same building. <laughs> so all of us are over here, and Andy got an office across the street in the CBS building. So he would have to come over once a week. And he would come over <clears throat> with a tape of his piece. So we saw him once a week. And uh, he would grumble. He'd walk around grumbling in the hallway. And then he would come in, at least with me and I, uh, several of the other correspondents, and he'd sit down. And he was just adorable. It was like, a, you know, he was funny. He was warm. He was particularly wonderful to young women because he had a bunch of daughters. Um, and he was always very supportive of me and other young women. There are a lot of uh, women at 60 Minutes. They're producers. And uh, he supported them. He seemed to have a special uh, place in his heart for women. Uh, and, but mainly, he was hilarious. Once he got rid of the grumbling, <laughs> he did grumble. I miss him a lot. We all miss him. And you see that that space hasn't been filled. No one could do it. You know, they, they tried other people before Andy, and it never worked. Um, and they're just not going to fill it unless somebody can be as good as he was. He just had a special gift. He was a brilliant writer, and he, he was funny writing. You know, people just aren't funny. It's very hard to do that, unless you're Tina Fey and Andy Rooney. I was wondering uh, if you're aware of any research, or you've done research, in terms of ki how kids report their relationship with grandparents. Yes. Um, kids, uh, well, first off, kids um, prefer their grandparents <laughs> to their parents when it comes to confiding in someone. They are more likely to turn to, if they're a, a young boy, to turn to their grandfather or a young girl to their grandmother if they're having a problem. And they often say, don't tell mom, don't tell dad, but FaceTime, fa Facebook, sorry, Facebook did a study and or put out some statistic that kids like their grandparents much more than they like their own grandparents, you know. So the parents, what I say? They like their grandparents more than their own parents. So there's a kind of statistical evidence that they're more comfortable dealing with us. And the, the reason is that our love is unconditional. We don't criticize them. And they know whatever they tell us, we're going to say, we love you. Um, 
They also need grandpa, and this is grandpa's job, to tell children about the history of the family, to give them a sense um, that they're part of something larger, and that's very important for young kids to know. Um, and grandparents, it's, when grandparents are in a child's life, it's said that they have more confidence, um, particularly grandpas. Grandpas have a huge effect on giving both boys, but also little girls, confidence. Uh, so there are all kinds of real roles that grandparents fulfill in, in children's lives. And it's not just when they're young. It's probably even more important when they're teenagers and they really are having problems with their friends or with their teacher or whatever it is. With all of the goodwill that seems to be most, most of the time for grandparents, why do you think the candidates don't play up their role as grandparents more? I know. Well, that's a really wonderful question. <clears throat> First of all, um, I thought that Hillary's age was going to be a huge factor in this campaign. Marco Rubio was trying to make it a factor, some of the others as well. Um, but now we see that all the leading candidates are grandparents, <laughs> and the other two are older than she is. So age seems not to be an issue anymore, suddenly. But I went up to uh, New Hampshire a year ago, a little more than a year ago, uh, and joined a, a Part, sat in on a focus group, and um, the pollster running it had allowed me to come to ask some questions about Hillary being a grandmother for the book. And uh, this was a time when Scott Walker was everybody's first choice. I'm going to give you a sense of when this was. Marco Rubio was second choice. Chris Christie was on his way up, and Jeb Bush was dead last. And I think this was when we still had 15 candidates. So uh, the pollster asked them, what one word comes to mind when I say grandmother? And the words were unbelievably wonderful. You know, warm, loving, unconditional, happiness, coziness, all these delicious words. Then I got up and I said, do you think Oh, and, and, and it's, not an, it's no secret, and it wasn't then, that Hillary's negatives were really high. And uh, she had a huge likability-ish problem. So uh, I got up and I said, do you think, given what you've just said about grandmothers, that Hillary being a grandmother will make her more likable and, and soften her image? And these were self-described conservative Republicans. And, and a lot of them, I was really surprised, said yes, they thought it would help as long as it didn't look as though she was exploiting the little baby. In other words, she couldn't walk around with the kid <laughs> attached to her hip, you know. <laughs> but short of that, it would help. So I am surprised that she doesn't talk about it more than she does. She mentions the kid and she mentions occasionally that she's a grandmother. But you know, given what I heard that day, and I can't believe she hasn't done her own focus groups, um, I, can't, I don't understand why she doesn't hit it every minute at every time she speaks, but she doesn't. So I don't know. Maybe she's still afraid of the age issue, but she shouldn't be. He's, uh, Trump's older. 60 Minutes this season has been extraordinary. I've enjoyed it more than I think any other year. How Great. do we... Uh, thank you. How do we pitch you for something we think is really interesting? <laughs> You're going to pitch me? Right. Here in this audience? Well, <laughs> possibly, if you wish. <laughs> is that uh, uh, yes? Uh, oh, okay. Well, let's ask the audience. You want it? They want it. Okay. The, the Reason Rally. You ever hear that? No. Yeah, four years ago is the first time they had a Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. A what kind of rally? Reason Rally. R-E-A-S-O-N? Yes. Yeah, okay. It was the largest collection of atheists and agnostics in the world. It was rainy all day, cold all day, and 40,000 people showed up. This year they should have 100,000 if it's good weather. They have incredible entertainment speeches and everything. It's just something that might be interesting to it cover. It is interesting. I like it. You mean okay. do a story on the rise of people yeah. admitting they're atheists? 
exactly. in the United States. For example, four, about four years ago, there wasn't a single politician that would address an atheist group. But now the Secular Coalition of America last year had seven prominent politicians giving speeches to Any the atheists. Any Republicans? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary? She I wasn't one so. of them, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is interesting, the rise of uh, people who uh, admit that they're atheists, people who now say they're unaffiliated with a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Um, so yes, it is definitely trending. I, it's, it is interesting. Thank you. Love to hear your talk about grandparenting. Um, I have a question about 60 Minutes and the format and the sustainability in this changing world of communications and how we hear stories. Um, is it sustainable going forward? And if so, what is that secret sauce of the kind of long form journalism you do that makes it sustainable? Um, well, first, wh why, why did this gentleman say it's, it's a re it was a really good season? It's interesting that we do both, both what you see on the air is exactly the way we've always presented the show, always, over 50 years, 40, 50 years. And um, the way we do our job is the same. So we can take weeks, we can even take months to do a story. And that's completely acceptable and understood as part of what we do. Some, some pieces take a week, some take three, and some take a year. And that's always been the case. So there's no um, crimping on resources. I told you we still go out with two camera crews um, and two producers. Everything's the same. And I think what that means in terms of the future is that there is a craving for long form journalism. Pro you probably won't be seeing it on television or network television in the future, but I do believe that you will s begin to see it on the web, in, in video, uh, in the future, because there is such an appetite. And it's just going to gravitate to smaller screens or different ways of communicating, but the kind of stories and the, w the way we go about it will sustain them. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. And our ratings have been incredible. We've, we've, I can't think of a year we weren't in the top 10, now we, we used to be number one. My f I always said it was me. My first year there, we were number one. I said it was me. No one else said that, but I said that. Oh no, my mother said that. Um, but we've always been in the top five or the top 10, and we still are. So, you know, there is an appetite, and uh, we, we get a pr pretty old audience. In fact, someone said to me recently, do you know who watches 60 Minutes? I said, who? And he said, old people and their parents. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually, it's actually really not true. We get a, a nice age spread. And I personally am convinced that there are an awful lot of really young kids who watch with their parents, but they're not counted when Nielsen goes to figure it out. They count the parents, they don't count the 10-year-olds and the 11-year-olds, and I know they're watching because they, kids come up to me in airports and things like that. So um, I, I just think there's an appetite. That's why it sustains. Thank you. Um, I had a wonderful Mother's Day present, which is a tea towel from my daughter who has two beautiful little girls. Oh. And the tea towel said, oh my God, my mother was right about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, it was probably the, I don't know whether to fly it as a flag or hang it on the wall. <laughs> You're very unique. I want you to know. I never expected it. But nonetheless, over the years, I've had conversations with her, and she's, uh, she's a lawyer. And she has chosen to stay home with her children while they're growing up. Mm. And part of it, I think, is because I said to her, if you're going to have them, take care of them, because you have only one chance to do it. Yeah. And if you can do it, do it. And she's doing mixed things at the same time, teaching at a law school at the same time, but she's doing it. I've gotten your book and I've read part of it. I've given it to someone as a gift who just had a grandchild as well. And I'm gonna ask you if you wouldn't mind signing it for me because 
I think in a few years when she has her turn comes, I want to give her this book. She said she's becoming more like her mother. <laughs> so. I wrote it as much for her as I yes. did for you. Yes. There's a lot in there about my daughter, and it's geared to both generations. Motherhood to grandparenting and the whole trip down along the way. So it's very lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I do write about all I missed when I raised my own child. And I have a girlfriend who, she's a, she's a prominent character in the book. Her name is Tish. Um, she had a huge job and was a single mother, raising two kids as a single mother with a big job that entailed a lot of traveling. <clears throat> and she just missed a lot, as I did. And her daughter, uh, her daughter's a, basically a single mother. She, she has a, her daughter has a wife who is sick. So her daughter is the sole breadwinner who has twins. And my friend retired and now moved to really be the nanny, full-time raising the children so that her daughter can earn the money to, to sustain the family. And uh, she told me that working mothers today are like grandfathers of old. Grandfathers always said, you know, I was never there when my kid was growing up and I, I want to be part of my grandchild's life. And I think working women are like that about their grandchildren. And it may well be, and I didn't really, I, don't, I didn't get this nailed down when I wrote the book, but it may well be that working women, when they have a grandchild, have an even more explosive reaction because um, we know we missed a lot, and we want to. We want to. We we feel there's a second chance here, in a way, to watch a little person grow up. We don't want to miss it again, you know. So, I don't know. I didn't really nail that one down, but it's in my head. Leslie, it has been an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.